Welcome to the Great Detectives of Old Time Radio from Boise, Idaho. This is your host, Adam Graham. If you have a comment, email it to me, box13 at greatdetectives.net. And uh, follow us on Twitter at Radio Detectives or become one of our friends on Facebook, facebook.com slash radiodetectives. Before we get started, today's program is brought to you by the financial support of our listeners, and you can support the program at support.greatdetectives.net. Over at greatdetectives.net this weekend, I have my review of the latest series of Sherlock episodes. And you can subscribe to my columns to have them automatically sent to your Kindle. You can try that out for two uh, weeks free through the Kindle store. Well, now it's time for today's episode of the lineup. As they mentioned, there was an off week, so this episode's from December the 12th of 1952. And the title is The Gasoline Bandit. Ladies and gentlemen, we take you now by transcription behind the scenes of a police headquarters in a great American city where under the cold, glaring lights will pass before us the innocent, the vagrant, the thief, the murderer. This is the lineup. Charlie Rice get here? Yeah, over there with Dave. Mm -hmm. Jepson couldn't make it. The man from the Skagway Station called and said he'd be here. Mm -hmm. Valley Division found the car. Yeah. Ten minutes ago. Parked on a side street in Granby. Stolen this morning from a man named Carlisle. He was on a hot sheet. What's that? That's a necktie. Oh. (laughs) My brother's kid gave it to him for Father's Day. He asked me to wear it once. Yeah, once will be enough. I'll see you later, Clint. Yeah, Ben. Hi. Hi, Dave. You hear that game today? Yeah. I'll never listen to another one. <laughs> I know what you mean. Hope we got a make on this bird who's been sticking up those filling stations. Three jobs in three nights. Me too. May I have your attention, please? You people out there on the other side of the wire in the audience room, may I have your attention, please? Thank you. My name is Cogger, Sergeant Pete Cogger. I'll explain the lineup to you. Each of the suspects you will see will be numbered. I'll call off a number, their name, and charge. If you have any questions or identifications, please remember the number assigned to the prisoner as I call his name. At the end of each line, when I ask for questions or identifications, call out the number. If you're sure or not too sure, the suspect have him help. The officers who took your name will assist you. They're seated among them. Please be prompt with your questions or identifications. When the prisoners leave here, they're sent to the washroom and dressed back into the jail clothes. It makes it quite difficult to bring them back after they leave here. The questions I ask these suspects are merely to get a natural tone of voice. So do not pay too much attention to their answers, as they often lie. All right, bring on the line. No talking, no talking up there. Now keep it moving over here to the end of the stage. Spread out, stand facing the screen. Take your hands out of your pockets, look straight ahead of you. When I call your name, step out to the white line in the center of the stage. Number one, Earl Feely, burglary. Come on, Earl, step out. Don't look at me, look out through the screen. I can't see nothing. Straight ahead. Where do you live, Earl? 3315 and a half Mission Place. Speak right up. 3315 and a half Mission Place? Yeah, that's right. Don't look at me. Face the screen. What do you do for a living, Earl? I'm a mechanic. You work in town? No, Cicero. How long you lived here? Almost eight months. Haven't you been working here? Couldn't find a job. How do you live, Earl? Hmm? How do you get along? How'd you eat for the past eight months if you didn't have a job? Oh, I had a little money, and I borrowed some. You own a car? Yeah, I got a car. Well, coupe, sedan, what? 46 Buick Sedanette. What color? Black. Any weapons? Hmm? 
Can't you hear me? Any weapons, Earl? A knife or gun? Oh, no. Ah, uh, number two, Irving Waxman, petty theft. Now, over to the left there, Earl. Uh, yes, sir. What's your address? 1897 Grant Street, apartment 308. Do you have a job? Yeah, I drive a route for the Columbine Laundry. Now, how long have you been doing that? About three weeks. What'd you do before that? You mean work? I mean work. They sold can openers. Where? House to house, you know. You have a car? No. Any weapons? No. Anyone arrested with you, Irving? Yeah, my wife. Virginia Waxman? Yeah. Anyone else? Guy who lives with us, Paul Darrow. I seen him in the next room before I come out here. Anyone else? Frankie Cedabaca. Cedabaca? Yeah, he's in the next room, too. Yeah, we know it. All right, slide on down. Number three, Stanley Wormser, assault. Up to the white line, Stanley. Where do you live? Uh, the corner of uh, Broadway in Florida. The number, Stanley? Uh, 351. And what is that? Well, that's where I live. Uh, what is it? An apartment house? Hotel? What? Well, it's a restaurant. You live in a restaurant, Stanley? Well, I, I own it. I, I live upstairs. That where you were picked up? No. What? I was picked up downstairs. Any weapons? Oh, no. What about the chair? Well, what about it? You were using it as a weapon, weren't you? No. Didn't you threaten a man named Ernest Grover with a chair? No. According to the officer's report, that's what happened? Well, they reported wrong. Usually don't make mistakes in these reports, Stanley. Did you threaten Ernest Grover with a chair? No. No, no, no. I broke it over his head. <clears throat> oh, pardon me. You know him? Who? Ernest Grover. Oh, no, no. He was just some yo-yo who drifted in my place and he was looking for trouble. Why didn't you call the police instead of getting in trouble yourself? I can handle trouble. You've got a lot to handle now, Stanley. Oh, I'll be okay. Oh, don't you worry about me. Oh, we'll try not to. Next, number four, Abraham Mason, vagrancy. Where do you live, Abraham? <laughs> Yeah? You got a minute? Sure. The lab finished with that car. Came up with two good prints. Make of you? Uh, working on it now. Uh, Rise didn't do any good, huh? I looked at 38 suspects. None of the others even got excited. Yeah. Stats office gave us a breakdown on the description. I've got them looking over the mugs now. Ashes with them. You want to go on down and give them a hand? Yeah. Uh, maybe we'll get something on those prints. I hope so. Been a cold one so far. Yeah. Well, see it. Bye. Seven, two eleven at Parkway Market. See the manager. KQAR nine fifteen. Twenty K code six. Two four five. How's the neck, Pete? Oh, still stiff. Three days now it's been this way. Mm. Did you see McMaster's? No, not yet. If it isn't any better by tomorrow morning, I'll go see him. You should have seen him when it first started. That's what the wife says. Oh, I looked this over. Oh. Those are the crime reports on those filling station jobs? Yeah. The M.O.'s identical on all three. Oh. Rise says the bandit drove in and asked for a tank full of gas. While Rise was filling the tank, he got out and went inside the station to use the phone. Rise got a good look at him then. He got another good look at him under the light inside the station. Size, coloring, build, general description matches up in all of these reports. Mm -hmm. Ben, this bird doesn't care if we know what he looks like. Sounds like a new boy to me. Just starting out. Yeah. And from what all three victims have said about his attitude, the uncertainty and nervousness, he hasn't had much experience. Yeah. Lieutenant Guthrie. You boys getting ambitious, Ben. Now what now? Just held up another gas station. 253 Pearl. 253. Thanks, Dave. Let's go, Pete. <laughs> Hundred and forty-two bucks, as near as I can figure. He didn't bother with a change. Mm-hmm. A hundred and forty-two bucks. Well, now let's check this back. Uh, you say it was a green Nash, late model, license number three seven J six seven seven eight. Yeah, that's it. I wrote it down when he drove away. Uh, and he's about six feet, dark brown hair, sport shirt, gray slacks, medium build. Yeah. Do you remember anything outstanding about him, Mister Todd? No, he was a nice-looking guy. Didn't look like no stick-up artist. 
I thought he was a nice fellow. Mm, about 25, would you say? Well, I'm not very good on ages, but around there, I guess. Now, he got out of the car and said he wanted to use the phone, right? Yeah, that's it, Sergeant. I filled the tank. He walked inside the station here. He was still on the phone when I finished. I came inside and he hung up and turned around and he had a gun in his hand. Well, I seen it right away. What kind of a gun? Little thing, a 25 or a 32, something like that. He didn't say anything at first. He just sort of stood there shaking a little. <laughs> then I began to shake. Well, I was scared that thing was going to go off. Well, he, he walked over to me, set it right in here. Man. He said, I want all the money you've got. He may have been nervous, but he meant it. I didn't argue with him either. Oh, uh, I, I got a customer. All right, go right ahead. Hey, uh, Pete. Hmm? You got any change? Oh, yeah, I think so. Yeah, here you go. Thanks. I'm going to call in. Hey. Hmm? What are these things for? Bugs. Stick them on the radiator ornament. Keeps bugs off the windshield. Hmm. 19th Precinct. As Sergeant Quine, please. Investigation, Quine. Anything on that Nash yet, Quine? Uh, yeah, I got a make on a few minutes ago, Ben. A, a Jack Myers reported it stolen at 4 o'clock this afternoon. Uh, good. Okay, thanks. Oh, uh, anything else? No, pretty quiet right now. No, hope it stays that way. See you. Right, Ben. Anything? Got a make on the car. Stolen. Hmm. You think you'll ever get this guy, Lieutenant? Well, we're going to try. Say, so, look, uh, did you happen to hear anything he was saying on the phone when you walked in? Oh, no, gee, I, I can't think of anything. Maybe he said goodbye to someone. You know, I really don't think he was talking to anybody on that phone. I think he just pretended he was using it so he could get me in here by the register. Uh, I, I got to give this guy's change. Okay. I think I'll get me one of these things. Seems a good idea. Well, if you're driving on a long trip to swell, I... Hey, hmm? A thirty-two's a woman's gun. Anybody's gun, Ben. No. You know, I was held up once before in 1946. Police never caught the guy. I don't think they even cared. We care, Mr. Todd. Might ask you to come down and look at some suspects tomorrow. Tomorrow? Oh, gee, that's my day off. Oh, we'd like to get this guy. Sure appreciate your help. Well... Okay, I'll talk to the wife, but I don't see how you're going to get him. He could be in China now. There's a... Oh, hey. That's a police car, isn't it? Yeah. Sure. Hi, Ben. Hi. This is Thelma Lacey. Works at the Pearl Street Pharmacy over there. How do you do, Miss Hello. Lacey? Hello. Uh, Thelma, tell him what you told me. I saw that man drive in here tonight, the man who held him up. Mm, go on. He was in the drugstore before that. Sat down at the fountain for maybe an hour. I didn't think anything about it until a little while ago when this officer came in. Uh, how do you know it was the same man, Thelma? Well, he had this green car parked out in front. It's a biffy-looking car. He just wheeled it around and came right in the station. I saw him from inside the store. Case it from the drugstore, Ben. Yeah, sounds like it. Did you talk to this man, Thelma? Oh, yeah, we talked. You've known him before? Oh, no. Tonight's the first time I ever saw him. He said his name was Roy. Did he tell you his last name? No, but I think I can find out for you. Oh, How? Well, I told him I was married, but when he left, he kind of laughed and said he'd keep trying. Said he'd drop in again and see me first chance he got. Every Saturday night on CBS Radio, Tarzan brings you new fascinating jungle adventures. It's the fabulous Man of the Wilds, created by Edgar Rice Burroughs, favorite of fiction and the screen. Yours to enjoy every Saturday evening on most of these same stations. Tomorrow night, stay with CBS Radio. Listen for Tarzan, Lord of the Jungle, for a thrilling story of intrigue, desperation, and madness titled Black and Gold. <laughs> Which one is this? Uh, number 13, Cherry Hill Station. 
Mm, $64. Yeah. Now, what's the total? Uh, $1,348. Not bad for two weeks' work. He's a one-man epidemic, Ben. Uh, he's making monkeys out of us, Pete. Thirteen jobs in two weeks, and we can't even get a line on him. We know exactly what he looks like and how he operates. We have his description on every bulletin and a half a dozen good prints from those cars he's stolen. Still, we can't stop him. Well, he hasn't pulled a job for two nights now. Maybe he's left town. I doubt it. He's been doing too well around here to quit now. Hey, I.D. wants to know if you know anything about these. Uh Uh-uh. Now, how about this one? Yeah, let me see. Yeah, Small and Crockett handled it. Okay, if they go over to work on it? Oh, yeah. Uh, you can put them on the night watch. Okay, Ben. Hey, wait a minute, Klein. Huh? Uh, while you're at it, we might as well get the rest of this stuff assigned. All of these filling station jobs have been pulled in suburban residential areas. Cherry Hills, Park Hill, Pershing Heights, Capitol Hill, Arvada, Lindale, and Monarch. Now, right in here. He doesn't move from this kind of area. We'll bank on that. And we'll bank on the fact that uh, you'll keep right on picking off these stations. Now, starting tonight, I want an extra car in every one of these districts. Two men in a car. Okay. It'll be up to the officers assigned to locate every filling station in that particular area. To keep special watch on those stations, including the ones that have already been held up. You might come around twice. Oh, what hours, Ben? Uh, Pete, uh, what's the time incident? Uh, None of the holdups have been pulled before dark, none later than midnight. Mm Mm-hmm. We'll start them at 7 and keep them on till 1, Quine. Okay. Every man should have a sheet from the stats office on this case. General description will be enough. At least most of them agree on that. All right. Is that it? Yeah. He's got 13 stations in those areas. About 82 more to go. Now, don't remind me. This is split everybody's shift, but we'll try it this way until something happens. Yeah, he's bound to make a mistake sooner or later. He's already made it. What? When he held up that first station. Thirty-three, a four fifteen at four four five five East Colfax. You're a nice night. Yeah. Want to turn down Chessman? Mm-hmm. I saw McMaster's today. No. Did he find out what's wrong? Yep. Funny thing. The minute I get in his office and lay down on the table, it stopped. Uh-huh. Yeah, my neck felt fine. Thought I was crazy. <laughs> Maybe you are. Oh, thanks. Hey, watch it. No, I saw him. Did he see you? Well, I was... Might be a 502. Unit 17K. Yeah. Want to call him in? Yeah. Hey, wait a minute, Ben. 211, yeah. slugging. Federal Boulevard and 32nd, filling station. Yeah, that's down one more block. Let's move, Pete. Unit 17K. 17K. 211, slugging, Federal Boulevard and 32nd, filling station. Ambulance on the way. There it is. Yeah. All right, 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 all Got a real wallop there. Yeah. Only uh, cash register like this? Yeah. Quine and I saw him working here alone about an hour ago. Checked back about 10 20, didn't see him around. Then we found him. Any witnesses? Not so far. I put out a call. Oh. He's coming to. Okay, Ken. Easy, easy. Oh, my hurts. Need oh. a hand? No, that's okay. Oh. Can you hear me, son? Yeah. I'm a police officer. Uh-huh. Ambulance will be here in a minute. Can you tell us what happened? He did take it. Easy now. He robbed me. How did it happen, son? He drove in. He said he wanted some gas. I filled his tank. Well, <laughs> while he came in here to phone. Now, what kind of car? It's a Chrysler convertible 50. You got the license? No, I... it was a cream colored job. Right, right then. Did you get a good look at him? Oh, sure. I was watching him all the time. I was filling the tank. When I finished, I walked in here. He turned around. He had a gun in his hand. I didn't think he meant it. I thought he was kidding me. I laughed at him. You've read about these filling station holdups, haven't you? Yeah, but not him. Imagine him coming in to hold me up. Maybe he didn't recognize me. You know him? Yeah. We graduated high school together in 38. 
Name's Roy Dayton. <laughs> Yes. What is it? Uh, how do you do? Uh, we'd like to see Roy Dayton, please. I'm Roy's mother. What is it you want? Is he home, Mrs. Dayton? I'm Mrs. Courtney. Roy's not home. If you'll give me the message, I'll see that he gets it. Uh, this is Sergeant Carger, Mrs. Courtney. I'm uh, Lieutenant Guthrie. We're police officers. How do you do? How do you do? Did you say police, uh, Lieutenant? Guthrie, ma'am. Uh, yes, ma'am. Is it something important? We'd like to know where we can get in touch with him. Well, he's out of town. I'm, I'm late for an appointment uh, right This now. is important, Mrs. Courtney. I'd like to talk oh, to you. Oh, dear. Will it take long? No. I, I don't wish to appear impolite, but I am late. Come inside, please. Thank you. Thanks. In here. Sit down, please. <clears throat> what? What is so urgent... Why, why do you want to see Roy? A routine investigation, Mrs. Courtney. You say he's out of town? Yes, he's in Chicago. Is Roy in trouble? Now, where is he staying in Chicago? I don't know. He'll probably be back in a few days. I'll, I'll have him get in touch with you when he gets home. What is it? A traffic violation? When did he go to Chicago? Uh, he left two weeks ago. Uh, Lieutenant, you have an annoying habit of disregarding my question. Why do you want him? We have reason to believe your son is connected with a series of hold-ups we're investigating. Positively absurd, Lieutenant. Absolutely the most absurd thing I ever heard. And we're just trying to get all the facts, Mrs. Courtney. We have to follow every lead. It's our job, you understand that? Of course. But doesn't this home and the obvious environment he's had influence you at all? And as I say, we have to follow every lead. Is Roy in Chicago on a visit, or is it business? Just a visit. But you don't know where he's staying? No. Did he go by train or plane? I had no idea. He left one night while I was out. I came home. All of his things were gone. Did he have a car? No. Roy always used my car. What kind of work does he do? You're making me terribly late. Sorry. Uh, Roy works for me, managing the estate and the ranch. Have you heard from him? Not a word. It seems strange he'd go away and not... That's an impertinent thought. Mrs. Courtney, understand. We have to find him, and we will find him. Our job is to get as much information about his habits and where he might be as we can. You act as though he were a fugitive. What is this all about? We can tell better after we talk to him. Well, I'm certain I can't help you then. Well, here's my card. If he gets in touch with you, would you mind giving me a ring, please? Not at all. What connection do you think Roy has with these holdups? We think he's the man who's been pulling them. Holding people up? With, with a gun? Yes, ma'am. Well, thank you for your time. Yes. Thank you. Good day. Lieutenant. Yes? Roy is not in Chicago. He's here in the city. Where he's living, I don't know. I've seen him on the street twice. He didn't even speak to me. His own mother. I don't know how he's living. He's always depended on the estate, me, for everything. That's why I've been worried this time. When we've argued before and he's left, he's, he's always had money with him. When it runs out, he comes back. This time, he took no money with him. He hasn't touched the account. Can you think of any friends he might be staying with? I've called all of them. Unless they're lying, he's not with any of them. How about his wife? You know about her? Well, we found out he was married to a girl named Corrine Hellman in 1945. The marriage was annulled. Do you know where we can locate her, Mrs. Courtney? I understand she lives in New York City now. Roy never should have married her in the first place. Well, why do you say that? His place is here. Uh, I can't delay any longer. It's past 11. You'll, you'll have to excuse me. Oh, certainly, and thank you for your help. Not at all. I'm, I'm certain this is all a mistake. I, I, I can't think of any reason Roy would go out and hold up a person. I can think of one. What? He hasn't touched your account. Well, here it is. How'd it come out? Well, the 
picture's 12 years old. Three of them were positive date and cigar. Want some of this? What is it? Iced tea. No, thanks. Ben? No, thanks. Brian, we'll have to print that picture if we don't get a line on him pretty soon. Uh, who's watching that house? Huh? Small and Ollinger. Crockett will go on a four with Murphy. Okay. Uh, you better keep one man free to watch Mrs. Courtney. Lieutenant Guthrie. I don't think you'll remember me, Lieutenant. This is Thelma Lacey at the Pearl Street Pharmacy. Well, sure, I remember you, Miss Lacey. What can I do for you? That Roy fellow that we were talking about, Lieutenant, he's in here now, having double malted milk. <laughs> Pull in here, Pete. Away from the entrance. Right. Now, be careful, Ben. He's a newcomer. Nobody's given him any trouble yet. Can't tell what he might do if he has that gun on him. Yeah. We'll stay close to the door. Oh, miss. Uh, miss. Oh, yes, sir. I'll be right there. Excuse me. Oh, okay, honey. Yes, sir. Yes, sir, I'm right there. A package of Chesterfields, please. Yes, sir. You've been asking you to go out with him? Yes. Tell him to come back and pick you up after work tonight. Aren't you going to arrest him? Uh, not in here. Uh, don't worry. You'll probably leave when you tell him that you'll go out with him. I see. Here are your cigarettes. Thanks. Uh, matches? Oh. Okay, thanks. And, uh... Don't be scared. I'm all right. That him, Ben? Yeah. A lot of kids in there. I don't want to take any chances. I'll walk on down to that dry cleaning store. He's uh, wearing a gray flannel suit, dark, straw hat, sunglasses. Might be out in a second. I got it. Paying his check, Ben. Yeah, be careful. Hey, Roy. Uh huh. Police officers want to talk to you. Uh, the police? What, what for? I haven't done anything. Hey, hey, well, what is this? We'll talk about it downtown. Let's go. You arresting me? What do you think? The lineup, where before you pass the innocent, the vagrant, the thief, the murderer. Listen again next week when we again bring you the lineup. Attention, please. You people out there on the other side of the wire in the audience room, may I have your attention, please? Thank you. My name is Cogger, Sergeant Pete Cogger. I'll explain the line to you. Each of the suspects. The lineup, starring Bill Johnstone as Lieutenant Ben Guthrie, with Jack Moyles as Sergeant Pete Cogger, was written by E. Jack Newman with music by Eddie Dunstetter. Featured in tonight's cast were High Everback, Peter Leeds, Parley Bear, Gil Stratton Jr., Howard McNear, Virginia Gregg, and Lee Patrick. The lineup was transcribed in Hollywood by Jaime Del Valle. Tomorrow night, Von Monroe's guest songbird will be Francis Irvin. Vaughn, Francis, the Moon Maids, and the Moon Men will be heard vocalizing on such familiar themes as My Favorite Song, Keep It a Secret, Boomerang, Close Your Dreamy Eyes, and other top favorites this week in America. Vaughn's college salute will embrace vocally, of course, Georgia Tech and Mississippi. Don't miss CBS Radio's Vaughn Monroe Show tomorrow night on most of these same stations. Dan Coverly speaking, and remember, America now listens to 105 million radio sets and listens most to the CBS Radio Network.
Welcome back. At this point in the lineup's history, it really does feel like a lot of these shows are very much uh, similar. They're not bad. Uh, at this point, they're all very proficiently run all the way through, but there's not a whole lot uh, new or all that different from week to week. Uh, speaking of that, we did get a couple of comments on the lineup. George emails in and says, My question concerns the recent episode of the lineup about the car hop murder. Was the cop exchange about cigarettes and advertising a not-so-subtle du- dig at Dragnet and its Fatima sponsors? Um, that's an interesting question, particularly in light of Chesterfield's being mentioned in today's episode. Uh, my, my honest answer is I certainly hope not. Uh, because that would actually be kind of pathetic. Because with the lineup, you have a program that has, has had trouble holding a consistent sponsor, and at that time did not have a sponsor. So making fun of the uh, sponsor of the top pr- police procedural, iffy. I, I doubt that that was the, what that was about. Uh, really, uh, cigarette advertising was all pretty much the same for the most part. Um, we don't, um, I rarely intentionally leave them in, but they're all similar. They tell you that the cigarettes taste great. They're, they're made from the choicest tobaccos. Uh, they'll talk perhaps about a T-zone, how they're light on the throats, and that, that's basically the whole, uh, promise of cigarette advertisements. And one reason why I tend not to play them is they're kind of boring and uh, repetitive. And that joke, really, a couple of weeks ago, they were just playing on the nature of cigarette advertisements on the radio. Probably the only exception to that. Um, and the most honest ad, keeping in mind that this was at a point when uh, we didn't have the facts, ab- uh, at least the public didn't have the facts about the cancer causing uh, properties of cigarette smoking was Camel. They not Camel, but Raleigh Cigarettes. They did a series of uh, radio ads where they said, "You know what? Uh, tobaccos, well, the way the cigarettes are made, they're pretty much all the same." Because what Raleigh was uh, promoting with its cigarettes uh, in um, late forties, early fifties was that it had a coupon on the back that you could redeem for uh, merchandise. And so their point was, they all taste the same. Ours come with a coupon on the back, and you can redeem for some free stuff. Their catalog program actually sounded pretty good, but I digress. Uh, Thanks so much for the question. And we have a couple comments on Facebook from L.K. Williams regarding the Modern Sounds case. I listened to the lineup, the Modern Sounds case. I enjoyed it in your comments after the show. I realized that people have been unfaithful from uh, the time that people started making promises to each other. However, the idea of glorifying that behavior, finding shameless pleasure in that behavior, setting it as a standard for the way we live our lives, not good. I'm not a prude, at least not in my mind, nor do I preach morality to others. I do believe in promises, mutual respect, and love as a reason for partnerships. Marriage, if you like. Lust is not love. I don't care what songs, movies, TV, or celebrities say. And she uh, posted another message says, However, I like old-time radio because it's less explicit. This allows me to imagine... Uh, as much or as little as I wish. Much of the media pushes the explicit so much we acquiesce, acquiesce to it so much that we don't set our own standards. We just go along with whatever everyone else is doing. Well, thanks so much for the comment. And I will agree that that is um, one of the great uh, charms of old-time radio. Um, is just that uh, it really is up to your uh, imagination and they don't quite push the uh, envelope as much. And I know that's part of the reason why we do have uh, more families. uh, We have some families that listen in. And I know that the less explicit content is a reason why a lot of them do so. So I appreciate your comments. Thanks so much. We will be back with you on Monday for uh, yours truly, Johnny Dollar. And then join us back here on Saturday for another episode of The Lineup. 
In the meantime, send your comments to box13 at greatdetectives.net. Follow us on Twitter at Radio Detectives and become one of our friends on Facebook, facebook.com slash Radio Detectives. From Boise, Idaho, this is your host, Adam Graham, signing off.